Ah, uh, well, you can tell I'm no longer on the sugar-free diet. I got this today. I've got gummies, and, and look, man, these are, these are the real deal. These are Haribo gummy bears, all right? This is like a King James Bible versus the other stuff, all right? All right, so, uh, amen. Whoever brought that, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, Amen. Well, I'll take it. I'll take the leftovers. All right. Open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And we're going to go ahead and continue uh, our study uh, and try to, Lord willing, uh, wrap all of this up today. Uh, this is how you know that you've got girls in your house. I've got my notes on this side, and I've got a dress colored on this side. A dress and some hearts, and hearts being broken, and... Anyway, oh, so I don't know what that's all about, but uh, every once in a while I like to have guys to my house just to remember, you know, there are men out there, amen. Uh, all right, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, and are you glad to be in church this morning? Yeah. I am, I'm thankful for it. I know the snow is not, you know, you wake up and you wish it was 70 degrees every day, but we do need the moisture too, so let's thank the Lord for that. Um, we're going to try to finish 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 today, um, starting next week, just so everybody's on the same page. Uh, we have Pastor Tim Havman and his wife Karen coming in for the banquet on Friday. hope everybody can make it for that. It's going to be a really good time. Um, and if you haven't gotten your money to Brother Craig yet, please do that as well. Um, Brother Havman, Pastor Havman will be speaking at the banquet, and then he'll be preaching uh, next uh, Sunday for Sunday school and Sunday morning. So I'm going to kick my feet up. And just listen, you know. Uh, but he's a good preacher. You don't want to miss it. Um, a whole book of the Bible is named after him. Right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wake up. Get some coffee in you. Amen. Um, but, uh, but anyways, um, what I'm going to do uh, after, after what happens here, we're going to start a series on the family. Um, and I realized the last time we did that was actually four years ago. Uh, so it's been a while. And it's probably a, a good time to do that again. Uh, we're talking about marriage. And uh, we're going to talk about marriage, we're going to talk about uh, uh, raising children from the little ones, from the time that you know there's a little bean in your belly, amen ladies, to the time that you've got them driving a car. Uh, there's stuff in the book, all there, there's, there's stuff in the book that covers all those things, all right? So we'll get into that. Um, and uh, it's going to probably last a couple of months. That'll be our Sunday school focus for a number of months. So um, I encourage you to be here for that as much as possible. I can't tell you how many times we have started a series on any particular subject, it doesn't matter what it is, and somewhere along the way, maybe a month down the road, a Christian will call me and say, I'm really struggling with something. I start talking to them, and I realize the thing they're struggling with is what they've missed for the last month in Sunday school. <laughs> all right, so I, I encourage you to be here, all right? It, it'll be good for you. All right, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and also today, uh, I'm going to try to leave a couple minutes toward the end of the class for questions, so we're going to have to run through this quickly, and I'm sure as I run through this quickly, it may cause more questions, so uh, we'll have some time at the end of this for questions. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll start reading in verse number 8. Uh, this is your good news verse for the morning. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. All right? And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be... There was a guy when I was in Pensacola who used to uh, announce for uh, WPCS, for Pensacola Christian College. And, and he'd always give a good news verse today. I always notice he never quoted any of these kind of verses, you know. Um, but uh, that verse is there for a reason. That is the uh, plan. The Lord's going to come back. And like the old bumper sticker says, boy, is he upset. Boy, is he angry. Uh, and that's because of sin. And that's because of the rejection of Jesus Christ in the world. Um, and you need to understand something. He came the first time as a suffering servant. The next time he comes, he comes as a reigning king. And the theme of the Bible is a king and his kingdom. Uh, the man that taught me the Bible said, um, you know, I know a lot of times people say if you lead someone to Christ, tell them to start. Is this mine? Hallelujah, this is mine. Uh, uh, man, if it wasn't, it is now. Um, but the man that taught me the Bible, uh, he said, I know a lot of times people say when you lead someone to Christ, tell them to go to John or have them start in John or, John, or, or start in Romans. He said, I like to tell people to go to Thessalonians. Because right off the bat, they learn that the most important thing I should be looking forward to in the Christian life is Jesus Christ coming back. Amen. And everything that I do in this life should be in light of when he comes back. And so what we're learning about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, as you see above here, is suffering as a Christian in light of the second coming. 
All right, now we talked about this at length. The first century Christians suffered because of their faith in a way that, frankly, a lot of us don't know much about. Uh, but there are some practical things you can learn here regardless. And doctrinally, what you're learning in verses 8, 9, uh, and 10 are, are things that have specifically to do not with the rapture of the church, but rather the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let me give you this. There, there's some uh, information. I don't know that it's all, I wouldn't say it's all gospel truth. But it's good information here. Uh, here you have information about, let's see if I got this thing working right, the first coming, all right? Uh, the other day, we were driving down Quincy. i got to tell you this. This is a funny story. We're driving down Quincy, and uh, me and Isabella, right? Was it you and me? And where did we come from? Church? It was church. That's what it was. Church. We were at church. Amen. It was Wednesday night after church. We're driving, and we see this car. We're heading east, and, and, and facing west is a car with flashers on. And she goes, Dad, you think we should help him? And all of a sudden, we drive over. It's a little bridge. These teenage kids jump out. Not onto the highway. I would have smacked them for that in Jesus' name. But they jumped up just to scare us and have a good time. And I, thought, I, 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 I pulled over. I thought, what in the world? And then I saw these kids sprinting to the car. <laughs> and you know what they were doing? They are shooting a laser at me going, you know. So anyways, uh, and it was a green one too, so that's what my mind just thought about. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, what you have here is some really interesting correlation between the first coming and the second coming. And you'll notice that there is a difference here between the rapture in the air and the public revelation of Jesus Christ when he comes back. And we, we've talked about that over and over and over. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, now, Clarence Larkin's the guy that does this chart, and I'll shoot straight with you. I don't know that I necessarily believe that. Uh, but uh, that's his information on the thing. I, I don't know that it's necessarily longer than seven years as far as tribulation is concerned. Here's what I know. I'm not here for it. Amen. All right? We're not going to be here for it. Thank the Lord for that. All right? But we understand that because we get taken up here, we come back with him when he's revealed to the world. And the passage that we're reading about, and it outlines that very clearly here, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, the passage we're reading about discusses that very thing. So in verse number 8, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, uh, again, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let me make this clear. Uh, this is not a matter of uh, God being a petty human being and God saying, you know what, you didn't play by my rules and therefore I'm mad at you. Uh, that's, that's, uh, the vengeance that God has is different than the vengeance that we have. God's is holy and God's is righteous, but it is still vengeance. Uh, go, if you would, to Proverbs chapter number 6, Proverbs chapter number 6, and look at verse number 34. Now, you're going to find uh, throughout the book of Proverbs that occasionally there'll be some doctrinal... Uh, Proverbs is a great practical book about wisdom, amen? And it's written as a father is writing it to his son, to a young man, to impart knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Uh, I don't know how or where, but one day I was driving down the road and I thought, I was trying to figure out what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And here's what I came up with, right? You may go, that doesn't matter, that doesn't mean anything to me. If it helps you, praise the Lord. If not, whatever. But here's what I came up with, all right? Wisdom is, under, is having the understanding of what to do with knowledge. A lot of times you get knowledge and you just sort of use it to kill people. You know, and that's, that's not good. <laughs> you know, a lot of times you learn sound doctrine, you go, let me show you what the Bible says. If you're not there yet, then you're wicked. And you just, hey, slow down, calm down. Some people need time. Think about how long it took to get you where you're at today as a Christian. To get you to even stand on the doctrinal things that you believe today. I'm not going to go through a whole uh, laundry list of things, but I'll, I'll just say this. There are some things that I'm convinced of today that took me years to understand. And while I can teach them confidently from the pulpit, if I'm dealing with someone who's struggling with it, I'm not going to talk to them face to face like I do from the pulpit. You understand that, all right? Uh, so, so there's a lot of practical stuff in Proverbs, but let me show you a, a little doctrinal nugget for you. And there's a number of things like this. We looked at one the other day on a Wednesday night. Remember that verse we looked at in Proverbs, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. Remember that? You say, what is that? That's a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Look at Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 34. Now, what he's talking about is adultery and, and why you shouldn't mess with it, stay away from it, run from it. Valentine's Day is coming up. All right, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, listen, guys, uh, contrary to Lay's potato chips, one wife is enough. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you bet you can't just have one. You better just have one. Amen. <laughs> if you're married, you better stick to one. 
Uh, it'll cause you all kinds, of, all kinds of grievances. Look in the Bible at the men that had more than one wife. Even where God, through the, through the man's ignorance, God winked at it, Acts 17, that was never God's plan from the beginning. God's plan from the beginning was one man, one woman. You say, why? Because that's how he did it in the garden. If he had wanted to be a, a, you know, a, 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 a harem, if you would, he would have given her ten wives. He didn't do it. He gave, he gave him one. All right? So there's a little warning for you. All right? Stay away from that. Now, in light of that, look at verse 34. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Now, uh, there, are book, there are laws in the books called crimes of passion. I'm not going to go into all of what that means, and some of you know what that means, and that's what that is. But let me give you this as well. Doctrinally, this refers to Jesus Christ. You say, why? Because when he comes back, he's going to be jealous. Who's he going to be jealous over? When he comes back, like, it, like we see up here, in the second coming to establish his kingdom on the earth, he's going to be jealous over the nation of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 23, Isaiah chapter 9, all right, where he establishes the government. The government is upon his shoulders. All right? And so it says, jealousy is the rage of a man. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever been reading through your Old Testament, and you've read stuff, and you go, man, that doesn't sound like, is that really God? You know, like he's going to wake up, and, and he's going to be like one that's shouting by reason of wine, the Bible says. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna rise up like the Bible says in the Old Testament. Almost, and I'm not being blasphemous here, the context of the verse that I'm quoting, I believe it's from Isaiah. Uh, don't hold me on that. Uh, but it talks about the Lord waking up as a man that had just basically been sleeping because of drinking. You say, what happens? When you wake someone up like that, you know what they're like? Argh! Right? Now that's the picture that he gives. I didn't write the book. He did. That's the picture that he gives of himself when he comes back. You say, why? Because the world thinks he's asleep, and he's not. See, just because God's patient and God's merciful and God's long-suffering doesn't mean that there's not a point where he says that's enough. All right? And so when he comes back, you say, what's the point? The point is that it's gone to the place where that's enough. And uh, so jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. You say, what is that day of vengeance? That day of vengeance is when he comes back to establish his kingdom on the earth. And we would call that the battle of Armageddon. Go back, if you would, to uh, the passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And uh, we are down in the outline. We are down at question number, we'll pick it up in question number 34. But number 33, if you don't have it. The word vengeance is an accurate description of what this day is described as from the Old Testament. You can read those verses for yourself later. And again, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 34, is a verse that shows some typology or some, some, some symbology of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, let me say this. Some Christians will look at a subject matter like this, and we're, like I said, we're going to get into a whole series on the family. And there are some people that might be tempted to go, well, that family stuff's practical. I like that. This doesn't matter to me. Yes, it does. There's so much you can learn about the nature of God that you're not going to get without studying this information. Yes, God is love, no doubt. 100% pure and righteous and holy love. And because He's pure and righteous and holy love, there's another side of God that you may not quite fully understand, which is the justice and the holiness and the judgment of God. All right? Listen, you can't have God love everything without Him being a pervert. Now, you may think that's hard language. It's the truth. If God loved everything, you know what he would be? He'd be a mess. All right? That's not, now, that's the God that I believe some modern Christians try to purport out there. Listen, there are things that God doesn't love. You understand that, right? There, there are some things in the Bible and the Old Testament that God says, hey, these things are an abomination unto me. All right? And, and, and we might run to look at certain sins out in the world. Listen, some of those things that he calls abominations are things that I would call sins of the saints. Amen? Yeah. You say, what? Pride. A proud look. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to take help from anybody. I don't need to be taught anything. A lot of Christians live that way. That's pride. Listen, there are things that God hates. Therefore, if he's a just God and a holy God, guess what that means? There's also the judgment of God. And that's what we're reading about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says here again, in flaming fire, verse 8, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it says there, there's a phrase interesting there. It says, on them that know not God. Now, uh, you may remember from the verses that we memorized, uh, keep your hand here, but go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 
We memorized 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in 2017. Uh, that was a blessing. Don't worry, we're going to find other passages of Scripture to memorize uh, for 2018 in a little bit here. But look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 5. Now, traditionally, if you're looking at, uh, at the Bible uh, from the Old Testament standpoint, now you say, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is where God is primarily dealing with one nation, and then there's everybody else. Now, let me be clear. God deals with individuals from the, Gentiles, from the Gentile nations. You read about that even in your Old Testament. But as a whole, God is primarily dealing with one nation, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. All right? And you say, why is that? Because the theme of the Bible is a king getting his kingdom, and that kingdom comes through the nation of Israel, which is why Jesus Christ said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, traditionally speaking in the Bible, those that know not God, you know who they are? The Gentiles. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and look at verse number 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which what? Know not God. All right, so, so you know what the word for heathen in Spanish is? And I know some preachers go to the original Greek, original Hebrew. I'm going to go back to the original Spanish. How about that? All right, the word for heathen is gentiles. Gentiles, man, that's what that is. All right, you say, you know what you are without, listen, without the gospel going to the Western world, you know what we, uh, listen, uh, listen, let me step back a little bit. Um, I'm in a very unique position. You say, why? Because I'm Puerto Rican. You say, what, what are Puerto Ricans? We're, we're all three races put together, man. And, and so I'm going to say some things you may go, oh, I can't believe you say that. I can say it to anybody and it can still work, you know. Um, but, uh, but let me say this for the white Western civilized uh, world. If it wasn't for the gospel, you used to be running around the, in, the, in the forest in Ireland and, and in Germany, killing each other and drinking blood. And the same could be said of Africa, and the same could be said of the Asian, the, the Native American tribes, so on and so forth. The Bible is what civilized the world, the Western world. All right? So we talk about the Gentiles which know not God. It is the grace of God, Romans chapter 11, that the Lord brought us in on his salvation. Thank God for that. Amen. Thank God for that. All right. Now, let me say this. Um, I was thinking about this yesterday. There is a difference between ignorance and ignoring. You could say it like this. Willful ignorance equals ignoring. Let me show you what I mean by that. Look at Romans chapter number one. Romans, you can keep your hand again in 2 Thessalonians chapter one. But uh, look at Romans chapter one. And then we're going to see an example of this from the Old Testament. There's a character in the Old Testament we can look at. Romans chapter one. And look at verse number uh, 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Who is the they there? It's the Gentiles. All right? You say, how do you know? Well, look back at verse 14. All right? Look, look at uh, verse 16. All right, he's talking about how, and again, what happens in Romans 1 and Romans 2, God is talking about how the Gentiles originally knew God. You say, why? Because the Gentiles was a man getting off a boat with his family. And everybody from there knows God, right? That's why you'll find, you know, the, uh, in the uh, uh, epic of uh, Babylonia, the epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah, You'll, and, and all throughout the different, different parts of the world, in the Asian cultures, in Chinese, ancient Chinese culture, you read about a flood that destroyed all these things. Um, the reason that's there is because, going back to the beginning, every Gentile, all eight of them, knew God. And so did their seed. All right? But eventually, look at Romans chapter 1, in verse 21, because that when they knew God, everyone knew Him, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You say, what is that? That's called willful ignorance. That is, that is a, a man. That, you know what that is? That's a man with a Ph.D. walking outside and looking at nature and going, uh, yeah, uh, there's no designer behind this. That's what that is. All right, uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me show it to you another time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 
And, and Christian, let me say this to you right now. If you ever feel pressure from academia, pressure from your career, pressure from your job uh, to, uh, to line up with how the world looks at things and what they say and, and how they view uh, uh, nature and science and evolution and fill in the blank, uh, don't. You owe them nothing. The Bible's right. All right. God is right. And what everybody else says is wrong. End of story. Amen. There's a bumper sticker that says, God said it. I believe it. Uh, what has that thing in? <laughs> God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That settles it. Thank you. That's it. That's it. You could cross out where it says, I believe it. God said it. That settles it. Right. Whether you believe it or not doesn't change truth. Right. You know? Uh, First Corinthians chapter 1. Look, if you would. Listen, let me say it to you like this. And, um, I've, I've heard people, they have, they have footage from World War II with the, the carcasses of people that were, I'm not trying to be gross here this morning, the carcasses of people who were starved to death in concentration camps. And there are people alive today who want you to take them seriously that say that the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, Holocaust, right? what is wrong with me today? I need to take my, you know, drink some more coffee, amen. Uh, <laughs> You know, the Holocaust never happened. All right, you know what that is? It's people looking at the truth and going, I don't believe it. Doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what, because I believe this. All right, First Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse number 20. Where is the wise? I like it when God says, hey, you, you think you got the answers? Come on, let's talk. I like it. The Lord does that in Isaiah a couple times, and he, and he, says, he says, there's no God beside me. Uh, look at uh, verse 20. Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world? See, the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world, they, go, they butt heads. Yesterday, uh, Brother James and I were fixing some goat fencing. And you know what those goats do the whole time? You know, they'll come up behind you. You know, they just, that's the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. Boom. All right. Um, it says this, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, you say what? The world's wisdom, yeah. knew not God. I was on my, uh, um, it's on the computer the other day, and there's an, there was an advertisement uh, for a show, and I can't remember what channel it was, and even if I did, I probably wouldn't tell you because it's just junk, but um, the uh, advertisement was for, was for a series called The First Man where they're going to show you how it went from this ape, and they're going to show you how it went from who, which monkey essentially gave birth to the first man. And, and they know because they were there. <laughs> you say, what are they doing? Living by faith. Just as much as I am. I got more proof on my side than they do. All right? Uh, but look what it says here. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. You know what's foolish to people today? You, you ask somebody, what are you doing on Sunday? Come with me to church. Why? Why do I want to sit there and listen to some guy shoot his mouth off, and then we stand and sing songs about a guy I can't see? That's how the world looks at it, right? Now, you say, what is that? That's the wisdom of the world, and that's how they don't know God, all right? And so look at, uh, I want you to go to your Old Testament real quickly with me. Number 34 uh, a character from the Old Testament, go to Exodus, a character from the Old Testament that serves as a reminder of them that know not God would be Pharaoh. You say, why? Well, look at Exodus chapter number 5 and look at his response when confronted with truth. Uh, you know, over there in the New Testament, uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And one day, toward the end of his ministry, uh, during his trial, he stands before a man named Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate has truth embodied standing right in front of him. And what does Pontius Pilate say? What is truth? Right? It's right in front of you. <laughs> right in front of you. Look at Exodus chapter 5 and look at verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now, by this point in time, there's been some things that have already uh, are, are, uh, been revealed to Moses uh, that are going to happen, and Pharaoh's going to learn who God is. But you know what he's done up to this point? He's willfully ignored who the God of the Hebrews is. Look at verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? By the way, when someone has a problem with saying, in so many words, I don't believe in the God of the Bible, really what the issue is, it's authority. Because look at what Pharaoh says. Who is the Lord that I should what? Obey. 
the problem is not in his head. The problem is in his heart. It's not that he can't look out there and understand. There is a God that's above all gods. Even when I hear people that come from an, a, 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 an evolutionary background talk about the Big Bang, I always go back to where did the energy come for that explosion? And, and they can't figure, they can't tell you. They can't, you say why? Because they refuse to believe what God wrote in the book. Who is the Lord? Now, the Bible says back there in 2 Thessalonians, you can go back there if you, if you want to. Let's go back. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're talking about them that know not God. Them that know not God. And it goes on to say that he's going to execute vengeance on them that know not God. Now, let me say this and state it very clearly. Uh, what you have is you're going to have the entire world under one global dictator called the Antichrist. And the majority, the vast majority of the world is going to be given an opportunity to take the mark of the beast. And, and the vast majority of the world is going to see some supernatural things go on in the tribulation, like Moses and Elijah preaching there in Jerusalem, and then they're beheaded, and then their bodies pff, rise back up. There's going to be some, you, you, listen, if you want good, really good sci-fi stuff, you want some really neat stuff, get in your Bible, it's there. All right, it's cool, it's really neat stuff. All right, the world is, 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 especially as technology, it's an interesting double-edged sword. While technology advances, man's morals are in decline. That's the truth. All right, without going into great detail, I'll put it to you this way. It used to take effort to find certain things you shouldn't look at. It doesn't anymore. Am I being honest? All right, the world is, is just boom like this. But what's interesting is, though hand join in hand, the whole world's what? Coming together. Now, as that goes on, do you understand what also is possible? It's also possible for somebody in China to hear the gospel through the Internet. There are, there are places, you said, that the government, you know, they, they channel all that stuff. Trust me, there are back, you know how I know, because there are European stations, I've never done it, don't want to do it, I think it's dishonest, but there are ways to watch movies for free. And if you're a Christian, shame on you if you're doing that. Amen. Amen. It's like skipping out on your taxes and going, well, I'll give it to God. Well, God's going, you're dishonest, man. You're a crook. And you say, why? Well, render to Caesar the things that be Caesar's and the things that God's to God's. I know that's not popular. Some of you go, well, I don't like it. Jesus paid his taxes. Man, I'm making all kinds of friends today. Aren't I? I, can, I can tell I'm making friends right now. Uh, but here's, here's the point. The world has the opportunity to know God. And you read about this in Romans chapter 2. If a person follows their conscience, it is then on the Lord to burden a Christian to go to those people. Do you understand this? God is just if he calls you to missions and you don't go and those people go to hell. He's still just. Because he did his part. It's up to us to do ours, right? And, and, so, and so the idea is this. If somebody wants to know God, there are some examples in your New, in your New Testament of this. Cornelius is a great one. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, you know what he does? He's a man that's given to prayer. He gives alms. He has a good testimony. And you know what? He's not saved. And because he's praying to God and trying to seek God and trying to seek God the best way he knows how, God sends him Peter. All right? And so, again, what you know is this. If the world wants to know God, they can follow their conscience. Now, here's the flip side of that. This is why we have missions. If somebody is following their conscience, say, in Chile, and they don't know the God of the Bible, and all they know is Catholicism, and they're going, I want to know the truth, I want to have it, and God burdens someone in this church building to go to Chile, and you don't go, listen, let me say it like this, I don't be, mean to be irre, uh, uh, irreverential or anything like that, but God's off the hook. Does he want them to be saved? Yes. He might move on to someone else, but what if he goes to three people and they all say no? It's a sobering thought. What if God burdens you to talk to someone in Aurora tomorrow morning? What if God gives you a chance after church today? On them that God's going to execute vengeance on them that know not God. All right, let's do our part to reach them before that time. Now, it goes on to give another descriptor here, and, and it says this, And that obey not the gospel, verse 8, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, That obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me be very clear with you. There are some people that teach uh, that to be saved, to be obedient, means that you quit all your, your bad habits. Um, as a preacher, it would give me no greater joy than to present that message to you. My job would be a little bit easier. 
If I could dang you over hell and say, you better quit drinking, you better quit smoking, you better quit gossiping, you better quit being proud, you better quit arguing with your spouse and for your kids. Amen. You know, you, you know, if I could do that and say, if you're real serious and you're really saved, then you stop all that stuff. That's how some people present the gospel. Some will even go to the extent that if you want Jesus to take you serious, you better be quitting all this stuff and then come to him. Listen, if that's the case, no one's ever going to come to Jesus. All right. Um, the Bible talks about obedience to the gospel. What exactly does that mean? I want to clarify that for you. Look at number 35 in your outline. In verse 8, the phrase, obey not the gospel, shows that the only obedience required for salvation is to the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. The other main passage that talks about obeying not the gospel is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Let's go ahead and go there. And we'll look at a couple others, right? First Peter chapter number 4. First Peter chapter 4. You say, what does it mean when you are not obedient to the gospel? That means you reject the gospel message, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul calls it the gospel of the grace of God. He calls it my gospel. But if you want to read what that gospel message is, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And in those verses, he outlines for you that the gospel is simply this. Christ died, number one, for our sins, number two, and was buried, number three, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And if a person wants to be saved, what they're going to do is they're going to turn from their self-righteousness, from counting on their baptism, their church membership, their being a good person, their fill in the blank, and they're going to say, I no longer am trusting this. I'm turning to Jesus Christ for my salvation because of what he did for me on the cross and because he shed his blood for my sins and he rose again. I trust him as my Savior. That's being obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. First Peter chapter 4, look at verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. That's a great verse, by the way. We cannot expect the world around us to clean up their act if we don't. All right? And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? You say, what's the end of them that obey not the gospel? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. That's the end. You know, think about this. When you're at work and you're having a good time, I mean, good cleanliness and fun. I'm not saying it's always bad, but you're laughing about something. You're talking about what you did over the weekend, and you call yourself a friend of these people. You don't give them the gospel? You know what their end is? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. Listen, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, a real reason, there's an impetus on us taking the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the world, guys. Let me say it to you like this. I'm going to challenge your thinking. We read missionary prayer letters on Wednesday nights. And we read them, we go, oh man, they, you know, they led this person to the Lord, or they're doing this, or they're applying for visas, and they're trying to get back in the country, or whatever. But let me, let me challenge your thinking a little bit. If you go a whole year reading a missionary prayer letter and you go, man, they haven't been able to lead anyone to the Lord in a long time. Why would you think that of them and not think it of you? Amen. What if we had to write letters to them? Right. Yeah. Let me tell you what's been going on in my life for the last month and what I've been doing and where I've been going and what I've been spending my time doing. Well, we do that because we give them money. Doesn't God give you money? Right. Doesn't give you a job? Aren't you accountable for that? Yeah. Well, you know, there's some people that you ought to be telling about Jesus Christ in, right? All right, let me show you this thing about obedience to the gospel a little bit more. Look at Romans chapter... Well, you're closer to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Now, I've heard people get a little bit messed up doctrinally by teaching works for salvation, and usually what they do is they go to a place in Matthew or they go to a place uh, uh, somewhere in the Gospels that presents something that has to do with the millennial kingdom, all right, which is after... Uh, uh, Jesus Christ comes back after this point in time. You've got the millennial kingdom that goes on for a thousand years. And they'll go to something that has to do with that to try to prove works for salvation. And, and they ignore the fact that the Bible is to be rightly divided. All right. Now, let me show you something in 1 John chapter 3. All right. And here's what it says in verse number 23. And this is His commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and, and love one another as He gave us commandment. You know what, what the commandment that needs to be obeyed for salvation is? Believing on Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. All right, look at Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter 1. 
Now listen, obedience to discipleship is a different thing altogether. I can't make that clear enough. Obedience for salvation is placing your faith in what Christ did for you and, 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 and trusting 100% on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sins. Obedience in regards to discipleship, boy, that's a different story. Boy, that, invo that involves being a witness for Jesus Christ. That involves sanctification. That involves, uh, if you've got a family, leading your family by example. Uh, and uh, that involves uh, developing a prayer life. That involves discipline. That's discipleship. That is different than salvation. Let me ask you a question. How much work did you have to do to be born? Right. Sounds like, if I remember correctly, for me anyways, mama did all the work. Amen? I just showed up, and every year I get presents on my birthday. It's wonderful, all right? Uh, but, but here's the point. When you got saved, you didn't do the work. He did it. But if you want to grow as a Christian, there's some work and effort that has to be put into that. But that's called discipleship. That's different. Look at Romans chapter 1 and look at verse number 5. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 5. And it says here, By whom we have received grace and apostleship. Why do they receive that apostleship for? For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. You say, what exactly is that? You say, well, they've been given the apostleship so that they could go out and preach the gospel to all nations, and those that would hear the message would be obedient to that gospel message and thus be obedient to what the Bible calls the faith. All right? Uh, let me give it to you one more time. Look at Acts chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6. Obedience to the gospel does not mean cleaning up your act or no one gets saved. And, and I tell you guys, I, when I hear someone talk like that, I, there's a little bit of an air of self-righteousness there. And they may not even always notice it or understand it, but it is. Because I sat down, I sat face to face with a guy one time who told me that he literally believed you had to do X, Y, and Z. And, and X, Y, and Z was quit this, quit this, quit this in order to be saved. The same guy, straight-faced, had, now listen, I'm not throwing stones here. If you struggle with cigarette smoking, I can tell you this. It's, I've, I know from my dad, it's probably one of the hardest things you could ever fight with. I'll love you, I'll pray for you. I'm not throwing stones at you. But on the flip side, don't be self-righteous and tell me that most of Christianity is going to hell because they haven't cleaned up their act. And I'm looking at you going, but you said you struggle with this. I said, are you saved? Yeah. That's funny how that works. So really, everybody else's sins are sent them to hell, but not mine. Now listen, if you're not saved, the reason you're not saved is because you don't have a payment for your sins. End of story. All right? Your, your soul and your flesh are still joined. Therefore, the sins you commit in the flesh account to the part of you that's eternal. And if you die without Christ paying for your sins, you go to hell. That's it. It's simple. When you get saved, God cuts those two apart and you still sin in the flesh, but it's not accounted to the part of you that's eternal. Therefore, you can experience what we call eternal security. But obedience to the gospel does not mean cleaning up your act and then getting saved. I would challenge anyone that believes that to tell me, have you cleaned up every part of your life? And if you're married, let me talk to your spouse. I'll find out real fast. Uh, look at Acts chapter number 6 real quickly. And look at verse number 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests, who are those people? Man, it's maybe some of the same people that are shouting, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. This is Jerusalem, right? A great company of the priests were what? Obedient to the faith. You know what that means? They trusted Christ as their Savior. They heard the message and they received it. That's what obedience to the gospel is. So when the Lord is talking to these uh, uh, Thessalonians through Paul, go back there, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, about those that obey not the gospel, in short, what he's saying is this. If somebody lives through this time period called the Great Tribulation, all right? Now, the Great Tribulation, we know from the Bible, the Great Tribulation is three and a half years. What Christians argue about is, is there any other time that leads up to that between the rapture and the second coming? And I've heard all kinds of theories, and I'm going to all of them right now, but here's the point. The point is this. If you're lost without Jesus Christ and you go in the Tribulation, there's a very good chance you're going to take the mark of the beast. And when he comes back, there's no hope. You can read about that in Revelation. The Bible says the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. All right, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and look at verse 9. Who shall be punished 
with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Now, uh, number 36 in your outline says, verse 9 is proof that annihilation, I'm going to explain what that means, okay? Annihilation, which is what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach, is incorrect. Now, again, I can't stress this enough. Um, sometimes I'll, say, I'll make a statement like that and someone will go, well, I know a Jehovah's Witness and they're a great person. I said nothing about anyone's character. Right. This is just doctrine. All right? It's just what is right biblically and what is wrong biblically. All right? Listen, man, I've got, I've got the majority of my family in Puerto Rico who are lost Roman Catholics. And I'll be honest with you, they're very good people. Some of them give more to charity than some of us in here do. They're good people. But if they're not trusting Jesus Christ, if they're trusting the church or anything else, they're not saved. All right? Uh, now, now look here at, at, uh, at this thing here in verse number 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach this thing called annihilation, all right? The phrase, number 36 in your outline, the phrase everlasting destruction shows us the eternal nature of God's judgment. Now, because we're running out of time, I'm going to uh, run through some of this stuff real quickly for you. Um, but I want to make this very clear. Everlasting destruction means everlasting. everlasting. Now, do I rejoice in that? Not a bit. Can I wrap my mind around eternity in either direction, heaven or hell? It's hard to, for me to do that. And I'll be honest with you, it's harder for me to do it in light of hell. I don't like to think about it personally. But I can't do away with the part of the Bible that I don't like. A lot of Christians want to do that to you. It's not right. All right? You know what you'll find across America today? Preachers in the pulpit who refuse to use the word hell. Hollywood will use it. Preachers won't. Something's wrong there. Let me give you some verses to write down, all right? If you want to write this down in your outline, Matthew 25, verse 41. Jesus says, depart from me, he cursed it, into everlasting fire. What do you suppose everlasting means? I believe it means everlasting. Well, what do you suppose fire means? I believe it means fire. Right. How, can you, how can you say that the description of heaven is literal, the gate of pearl and the, the rainbow round about the throne like an emerald and a white throne and the sea of glass like a crystal and all that kind of stuff and say, oh, that's literal. It's going to be a beautiful place. But when Jesus talks about hell and fire, that's just, that's just figurative. Right. All right. Luke chapter 16, verse 24. Luke 16, verse 24. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Matthew 25, verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoso receiveth the mark of his name. Now, uh, I had some, uh, some different versions. I, I finally got to it, and I didn't pass them out. But I'm just going to read this to you out of the uh, New Living Translation. Go to your Bible to Mark chapter 9 real quickly. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, and look if you would at verse number... 44. And who's speaking here? Jesus Christ. Now, if you've got one of those red-letter Bibles, you'll see that, that wording should be in red letters, right? Uh, Mark 9, verse 44. What does your Bible say? Where there a worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Let me read you from the New Living Translation. It's not there. It goes verse 43 to verse 45. Now, the argument is this. Here's what the argument is. The argument is this, that in the best manuscripts, that doesn't exist. That's what they say. Uh, let me give you this. I've got one. I'm, I've got a, this is a Greek New Testament. And I've got, uh, 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 this is the 27th edition of Nestle Allen uh, Metzger's uh, Greek manuscript, uh, Greek text, rather. And what they do in here is they'll give you, they'll cite the manuscript evidence for when a verse should be there. And what's interesting is they don't quote verse 44, but down in the little footnotes at the bottom, you know what they do? They admit that there's a lot of manuscripts that have it there. So here's a question. Who would want to remove hell out of your Bible? Now I've got, uh, uh, let's see here. 
I've got uh, unsealed manuscript A, unsealed manuscript D, unsealed manuscript uh, o, o. I've got uh, um, um, uh, the uh, cursive manuscript F13. I've got the majority text. I've got the Latin text. I've got the Syriac uh, uh, Peshitta text. I've got at least seven different texts right there that have the verse there, and it's gone from your, your modern Bibles. Now, why would they choose to do that? The majority text. You know what that means? The majority of manuscripts side with the, the King James Bible. Why would they take it out? Oh, well, it doesn't matter if, if the words held it. Well, why, why would you have to change it if it doesn't matter? Leave it alone. All right, look at verse 46 in your Bible. Same thing. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 48, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, you know what's interesting about that? I read uh, in the NIV, which I think we have maybe here. Let's see. I've got all kinds of interesting stuff below here. Okay, that's amplified. That's the message. That's like you're never going to get anything out of that anyways. Um, let's see here. I think, okay, okay. So it is different. I think NIV does contain it, but let me read it to you. Mark chapter 9. Now, some of you may think this is pointless. Why are you doing this? When you start messing with one word, boy, it changes everything, all right? Mark 9, verse 44 in NIV. Actually, no, it's gone. Verse 46, also gone. Verse 48, here's what it says in verse 48. They have it there. Where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, let me think about what Jesus actually said. Where their worm dieth not. I'm going to give you this and then we'll take questions, all right? I know we didn't get through all of it. Sorry. That's just get used to it. We never finish everything we want to finish. All right? Um, but uh, Jesus says where their worm dieth not. Why? In eternity, Christian, whose image are you going to be fashioned in? You are predestined, Romans 8, to be conformed to the image of His Son for eternity. Right? So what happens, you say, what is that? You're going to be conformed to the image of the everlasting Father, Isaiah chapter 9. What if your father's the devil, John chapter 8? Whose image will you be conformed in for eternity? Well, how do you show up in the garden? Serpent? Where their worm, it's a reference to their soul. Do you understand that soul is the most precious thing a person has? And the Lord died to save men's souls. Amen. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul for eternity? Now again, I, I, I didn't get time to go through everything, uh, but... This is an interview between Schuler and Billy Graham. Um, tell me, what do you think is the future of Christianity? Asked Schuler. Billy Graham. Now, let me say this. Billy Graham led more people to Christ than you and I did. Yeah. I'm not going to take anything away from that. I believe to be, in a historic, uh, to be historically accurate, you can't take away from that. However, toward the end of his life, he was pushed and pushed and pushed into more compromise. And, 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 I, and my heart breaks for him, honestly, because I look at him and I go, man, I believe, I'll never forget one time I'm in the church in Tennessee. I go there on deputation in 2003-04, and uh, it's a great church. I go back about five years later to talk about coming to Colorado, and, uh, and I'll never forget. I'm sitting on the platform with the preacher, and he looks over to me, and he goes, I just want you to know I'm sorry. See, what was he, about, what was he apologizing for? What was about to come in the worship service and the preaching? And he said, I'm sorry, they're just telling me this is what people want now. I feel bad for guys like that. I'll, I'll tell you this, by the grace of God, I'm not saying this to beat my chest, but as long as I'm the pastor here, we don't, we don't do that. All right? Now, now let, me, let, me, let me give you what Billy Graham says. He's calling people out of the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world, Buddhist world, Christian world, the non-believing world. They are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something they don't have, and have, they turn to the only light that they have, and I think they're saved, and they're going to be with us in heaven. Schuler goes, what I hear you saying is it's possible for Jesus Christ to come into human hearts and soul and life, even if they've been born in darkness and have never had exposure to the Bible or the truth of the gospel. Is that a correct interpretation to what you're saying? Billy Graham says, yes, it is, because I believe that. Schuler says, there's a wideness in God's mercy. I'm so thrilled to hear you say this. Billy Graham says, there is, there definitely is. And he goes on to say, hell is not the most popular of preaching topics. I don't like to preach on it, but I must if I'm to proclaim the whole counsel of God. But listen to what he says here following this. 
The most outspoken messages on hell, the most graphic references to it came from Jesus himself. Great. It's good so far. Jesus used three words to describe hell. The third word that he used is fire. Jesus used this symbol over and over. This could be literal fire, or as many believe, it could be symbolic. I've often thought this fire could possibly be a burning thirst for God that is never quenched. No, that's not what Jesus said it was. All right? Uh, I could quote some other stuff here. I don't have time to do it. But you understand where modern Christianity is at with that. They don't like the idea. And guys, I'll be honest with you, I don't like talking about hell. But at the same time, if Jesus is, is if we're going to take Jesus at face value, you know what that means? We need to preach about it. Because that's where a soul goes without Jesus Christ. All right, now, I know we've gone over a little bit, but I still want to give you time for questions. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in verse 9, uh, again, about the, and you, uh, the quotations you had from the Telegram interview, again, this goes as, I've heard people also say that this destruction from the presence of the Lord is just not being in the presence of the Lord. I didn't get to get to that yet. We're going to get to it next. But I'll, I'll give you this preview. I'll give you this preview, all right? Because we're going to have to stop this series and we'll have to come back to it after our family series. But the preview is this. This particular verse, this particular passage, has to do with when Jesus Christ comes back. If you would, look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and look at verse number 8. Talking about the Lord at the battle of Armageddon and the Antichrist there is called the wicked. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now what's going to happen is, the Lord's going to come back, and it's literally going to, it's like a nuclear bomb, an atomic bomb going off at the battle of Armageddon, and there's the armies of the world that had gathered on Jerusalem are just, they're going to be destroyed from the presence of the Lord. However, what goes on later on, guys, here's, David says it like this in Psalm 138, I believe, he says, Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? If I ascend to the heights of clouds, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, you believe the Bible? Yeah. That's what he said. Lo, thou art there. And God never corrects him. You say, why? You cannot fully escape from the presence of God in the universe. You can't. All right? Even in, in the, the eternal nature that is to come, God fills all in all. All right? Now, so when someone says, Hell is just separation from God. They've never read Revelation chapter 14. If you read Revelation 14 and read verses 10 and 11, you know what the Bible says? They're going, their smoke and their torment is going to go up forever in the presence of the Lamb and of the holy angels. You know what that means? In His presence. So that means it, 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 they are, He can see them, they can see him. Listen, there's something to that. That's why Luke 16 is a powerful message. All right? Uh, so my point is this. Hell is not simply separation from God. This particular passage has to do with when the Lord comes back and they're going to be destroyed from His presence at that moment. That's their body. And then what happens after that is an eternal thing that goes on in hell, and that's the everlasting destruction spoken of in verse 9. Does that make sense? All right? I hope it does. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so what you're referring to is in chapter number 2 of Second Thessalonians. He says that they're going to have strong delusion that they should believe a lie. All right, verse 11. All right, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here's the question. Here's the question. The question is, when the Lord sends out the 144,000, who are they preaching to if everybody's already sealed? If their faith's already sealed, all right, now, you can make the argument, here's another argument, people are still having children in the tribulation. Innocent children. When the Lord comes back to set up His kingdom, they can go into that kingdom. Right? So there, there, there's, there's a lot of different things at play there that sometimes from a practical standpoint, we just don't think about. Um, but uh, here's what it, it says there again in verse number 11, uh, this God, God, uh, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, they should believe a lie. But here's what you find out. In the tribulation, there are people that are left behind from the rapture who turn to Christ. All right? Uh, there are those that don't take the mark of the beast. There are those that, according to Matthew chapter 24, 
endure to the end of the Great Tribulation. So it can't be an automatic sealing of 7 billion people's fate or however many people are on the earth at that time. Uh, as much as it is God describing if somebody doesn't want the truth and they are, excuse the expression, hell-bent on having delusion, God says, okay, here you go. Here's your, here's your fake Messiah. And that's what they're going to receive, by and large. However, there's still a remnant. And that's the word, that's a key word in the, in the book of Revelation. There's a remnant of people that do believe. Uh, the prophets that are sent, and they do believe Moses and Elijah, and they do believe the message that's being given to them. Um, I, have, I have a strong feeling there'll be some people that possibly uh, were being witnessed to before the, rap, before the rapture takes place, and they put it off, and they put it off, and they put it off, and they put it off. And I have a feeling that some of those folks might be part of that remnant, because they go, man, this guy witnessed to me day and night, told me this thing's coming, and it finally came. Um, of course, these are things, you know, we, we don't know who's who, we know how it's all that's going to, all that's going to end up, but uh, I don't believe it's an automatic sealing of everybody on the face of the planet. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned the, uh, changing the word and changing the context. Right, right. Punctuation as well. Oh, yeah. Yep. Forever, forever sat down. They move the comma before, yeah, yeah. And so that's a great example in verse 12. Uh, the point is there's one eternal sacrifice for sins. It's not that he sat down forever, because that's not even accurate. He gets up. That's what, the, that's what you read about. Arise, O Lord, let the enemy, let thy enemies be scattered, right? That's the second coming, so... All right, based on time, we better stop here, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll give it about five minutes, and we'll get going here in a little bit. Let's all stand.